What is up, people? Welcome to another episode of Key Gripe, the show for short, sweet reviews of new release movies, plus the one thing that annoyed me the most. Today, I'm going to be talking about X-Men Apocalypse, and now this is going to be a spoiler-free review. I'm also going to do a second part where I do a spoiler review, or not so much maybe a review, but also kind of addressing the things in the movie that I feel need to be addressed, and you'll understand why following this review that I kind of needed to address some very specific things from the movie, so it will involve spoilers, but I figured I'd at least give you a spoiler-free review so you'd know this is kind of what I thought about the movie going into it, and then in the second part you'll see the, um, if you have seen the movie, then you'll get a little bit more spoilery review. So, first of all, let's kind of jump right into this. So, X-Men Apocalypse is really the, it's technically the, you could say it's the sixth X-Men movie, like the X-Men team movie. In the X-Men universe, though, this is definitely number nine, uh, when you include the two Wolverine movies, plus Deadpool, and the six X-Men movies up to this point. So, we've already been in the X-Men universe for quite a while, and this movie obviously doesn't discount any of the other stuff in terms of, you know, who the characters are and were. There are certainly inconsistencies, but I'm going to get to that. But, I mean, you still have, you know, Hugh Jackman playing Wolverine, you still have, you know, the Magneto and um, Professor X from, you know, the new, the first class generation of the X-Men, who obviously team, you know, basically were working with Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen's in Days of Future Past, the previous X-Men movie. So here we are at, you know, almost basically the end of the second trilogy of X-Men series movies, really. And what's basically happened here, so with the end of Days of Future Past, they sort of reset the timeline a little bit. And so new things are happening, things are changing. So when we jump into this movie, it basically, at the end of Days of Future Past, I should say, at the tail end, they showed a scene with Apocalypse, you know, building a pyramid, essentially, um, you know, just, you know, signaling the first mutant, like the first, you know, real mutant in the world was Apocalypse. Um, and so we start basically with Apocalypse being this, um, and I call, I'm going to call him Apocalypse because I cannot pronounce his name. It's an Ensur, Ensuburner or something like that. But basically, he, you know, is, you know, amassing all of these mutant abilities. That's what he is capable of doing, is just taking other mutants' abilities. And in this mo in, in the beginning, he, you know, is starting to take an ability where he can basically get his, you know, basically regeneration. So you know, protect himself, live longer, and all that. So as he's doing this, he's betrayed, and the pyramid is, you know, destroyed upon him, and he basically gets locked in, you know, this, in the rubble. So then the movie jumps forward to the present, uh, or at least the present for the movie, which would be the 1980s. Cool. And, you know, we're basically back in with, you know, the X, you know, the X-Men are still, you know, kind of, you know, doing their thing. You got, you know, the school for the gifted, you know, Professor Xavier is, you know, you know, curious about some, you know, weird things that are going on. Um, the effects from Days of Future Past are still kind of being, you know, known. You know, people are, you know, they know about Magneto and what he tried to do, basically, you know, and, you know, Mystique is almost held up as this, like, you know, kind of hero mutant who, you know, stopped Magneto and, you know, saved the world in a way. So you've got, you know, kind of this, you know, it, the the effects are still you know being felt even ten years after they happened, um, and so basically then what happens is there's an event that um, um, uh, Rose Burns character can't think of her name for some reason, um, but basically she is um, you know in the CIA and she's um, following you know somebody you know she's you know looking for some clues into some mystery and she basically uncovers the cult of apocalypse so it's the cult of people who are trying to basically bring apocalypse back to the world and um this sort of wakes up you know professor x and gets him involved in it um next thing you know apocalypse has risen and his first task is really to acclimate himself to the to the modern world he's in now as well as you know gather his four horsemen because apocalypse always has four horsemen that he imbues with you know basically takes their power that they already have and just enhances it so like storm um 
Archangel or Angel, however you want to, whatever you want to call him in this case. I call him Archangel because he's got the metal wings. But um, Psylocke and uh, Magneto basically are the ones he chooses as his four horsemen. And from this, he's basically, you know, starting on this plan of world domination. And so it's up to the X-Men, you know, Professor X and his, you know, team, uh, which consists of, you know, Beast, uh, Mystique in a sort of way. I mean, not really, but kind of. And then like his young, you know, his young people, um, you've got Cyclops joins the fray. You've got Jean Grey, um, Nightcrawler, you know, in the beginning of the movie, uh, Mystique basically saves Nightcrawler from this, you know, kind of like circus world that he's forced into. And so they, you know, they gather this team, but then Apocalypse shows up and kind of kidnaps the professor and basically wants to use his power, his enhanced power to, you know, basically, you know, take, I mean, he basically wants to destroy the world in an effort to create a new world. Um, and of course, at the end, the X-Men, you know, gather their things, you know, basically gather up themselves and, you know, put up a front to, you know, basically fight. And once again, it's, you know, the young people, it's, you know, kind of like, you know, X-Men first class where it's like, you know, these are the kids, these are the ones who are actually going to stand up against Apocalypse um, with the help because, you know, Professor X is sort of out of commission at this point. I mean, the, you know, the strong ones that they have are Mystique and Beast. Um, and, you know, basically that's, that's what they're, you know, they're, they're sort of stuck with, but, you know, they, they ultimately, you know, fight Apocalypse and without giving you away, they defeat Apocalypse, uh, but not without a lot of damage being done in the process. So, um, that's kind of the nutshell. I mean, there's a little more nuance to some of the parts of the movie, but that's kind of the nutshell plot of X-Men Apocalypse. So, did I like it? The answer is no. The answer is I really, it's not that I hated this movie, it's that I was extremely disappointed. And to, to be honest, going into it, I didn't have a very good feeling about it. None of the trailers, none of the art, nothing that they really had, like, put forth, you know, to get people excited about this movie got me excited. Um, which is not to say that, I mean, I could say the same thing about Captain America Winter Soldier. I wasn't excited going into that movie based on the trailers. But n with this, I was really, really worried. And the movie actually kind of took my worst fears and realized it. X-Men is such a diverse franchise. It's one of those that has so many great characters they can draw from and they've done it for they've done it well in the past i can say you know days of future past was a good movie um first class the first two x-men brian singer x-men movies were good uh one of the wolverines is good deadpool deadpool was definitely good yeah deadpool um so i mean the x-men series has some good characters good movies they've had you know good success which is good this was not good because what this movie did was it basically made X-Men The Last Stand, which has arguably been the worst X-Men movie next to um, Wolverine Origins. It has actually made that movie look better, which is extremely, <laughs> extremely disheartening. Um, one of the biggest problems people have with Last Stand is that they threw so many characters in there and they just basically went with this plot. You know, they killed off Professor X. You know, they killed off Cyclops. They made Jean Grey this, like, you know, nightmare kind of character. And they just basically, you know, kind of threw all this stuff to, on, onto the screen trying to make this big epic finale. And it just, it felt hollow. This movie felt even more hollow than that. And it wasn't necessarily just the story. It was also just a lack of any sort of urgency or interest. I'm not going to say the actors didn't care, but none of them really seemed like they did care with the exception of some of the young character with some of the younger actors. I'm not going to say everybody in this movie was terrible, but a lot of them just were not, they didn't, there wasn't that like gravitas that you had seen from like Magneto is one of those characters that they've really tried to explore a lot and kind of, you know, the, you know, the, the kind of the two faces of Magneto. They've really done a good job of exploring that in previous movies. In this one, they try that, but it falls flat, and from that moment on, he's just this kind of empty shell. And then you have Professor X, and this movie was... I mean, it was hard to see Professor X in this movie as anything other than just kind of this, like... He, he didn't have that command, or that, like, 
you know, that respect, it, you, he didn't command the respect you would from Professor X, say, like, from the Patrick Stewart, where he was very, you know, you know, by the book, he was very, you know, clear-cut. You know, it, it, it was the Professor X from the comics that we knew and loved. Here, though, he just, it, it was almost like when we first met Professor X in, when we met Charles Xavier in uh, first class, when he's, you know, hitting on women in the bar, basically. It was that kind of, like, cocky college type of Professor X. Here, it almost felt kind of the same. You know, he, he really didn't seem like he was that invested in being this, you know, serious character. Now... I do want to make a I want to make a you know concession here is that I didn't expect this movie to be super dark. I didn't want it necessarily to be dark. Granted, Apocalypse is one of those villains that I was oh, I've been wanting to see on the screen for a long time because he's such a complex and wonderful villain and something that in the comics he has just brought so much like He's he's such a great adversary, and you know, in in this age where you know there aren't a lot of terrific villains, we needed somebody like Apocalypse to come in and just like show it's like this is how it's done, you know, like have like a Heath Ledger type of Joker. It's like this is how you do a villain right, um, and it didn't work. <laughs> Sorry to say, but um, Oscar Isaac, for all you know, for for all intents and purposes, he's a great actor. I'm not taking anything away from his performance or his ability to act but they made the villain kind of you know cheesy you know just looking which I mean I'm, I'll give them at least that that it's still just a movie and they can only do so much with you know makeup and CGI and all that but at the same time they made his character so one-dimensional without giving any real like depth to the character that it was like I don't you know, I don't know why Apocalypse is trying to destroy the world I, I they give me no reason and ultimately, at the end, the only reason you can come up with, with why Apocalypse is even there is to give the X-Men a reason to unite. That's that's literally the only thing that, that they come up with. You know, Magneto has a sort of revelation at the end, but it's nothing that's that you haven't already seen before. Um, you know, it unleashes certain powers, which... In my second part, I will explain this one. But that's another thing that you haven't... You've already kind of seen before. I mean, it... It, it it doesn't really tread any new ground, and I think that was my biggest problem with it. I mean, the first half of the movie, I couldn't tell if it was an actual X-Men movie or a parody of an X-Men movie. There's even a line where, you know, they they go to see Return... You know, a couple of them go to see Return of the Jedi, and when they come out of the theater, they're like, yeah, but the third one is always the worst. And you can tell that that's kind of a dig at Last Stand, but when you get to the end of this movie, it's like, this movie was worse than Last Stand. They're actually proving their point here in the movie, that... This is, I mean, this is, this is the weakest of this new trilogy. And what makes it so weak is there's no urgency, there's no purpose, there's no weight. You know, most of the characters don't even care. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence, as great an actress as she is, she doesn't seem to care in this movie. And I don't want to say that she didn't, but I mean, her character is just very like stoic, very like one dimensional, very, you know, there, there's not a lot of you know, real, there's no change, there's, it's just her, like, I don't want to be an X-Men, but we got to stop this guy, so let's do it, and at the end, it's like, you know, don't be funny, you're X-Men now, it's, it's, it's so, you know, deadpan, and, and just solemn, it's, it, it was really hard to, like, really want to care, I mean, they, they did try to insert moments of levity in this movie, with, like, um, definitely with Quicksilver, they gave him another scene, which, incidentally, it really, like, I didn't love, I, I enjoyed the Quicksilver scene in Days of Future Past, and I knew they were going to do something just like that in this movie, but what really kind of, like, annoyed me this time was the fact that what I didn't really see last time, it was explicit this time just because of the situation, is this reminded me exactly of the scene in the episode of Futurama where, dr where Fry drinks 100 cups of coffee. It was almost exactly that, of, and, which is... <laughs> I mean, it's. I guess if you're if you're paying homage to uh, Futurama, you did a good job. But if you're trying to make this like a badass scene, I'm not gonna agree with it. I I don't think it was well done. And there, I another problem I have is with that. You know, with what they are doing with Quicksilver, I have another problem with that too. So this movie is kind of a mess from the writing, the acting. You know, the visual effects at times are pretty good, but otherwise, a lot of it it's just like insert. In, you know, insert visual effect here kind of thing. I mean, there's it's it, it's so big and so bloated 
and it's directionless. It it was such a letdown, and I can't I can't stress enough how disappointed I am walking away from it. Is you know I I I can't I couldn't imagine it being worse than X Men: The Last Stand, and it was, which is saying something. That real I mean, when people talk about X Men: The Last Stand as like one of the worst comic book movies, the fact that this didn't achieve even what X Men: The Last Stand did is because even that one had some you know had some emotion to it. This one nothing. I mean, there was maybe one or two scenes and there was one scene that should have had a ton of emotion in, and they just kind of glossed over it, you know, and then they threw new characters in like Storm, you know, gave her some, you know, gave her this like really humanizing moment early on and then forget about her until the end of the movie. And then you get other characters like Psylocke who, you know, has some pretty neat powers and they kind of just turned her into a villain and didn't really do anything with her. I mean, it was almost like, they tried to do so many different things with so many different characters and without ever actually coming up with one cohesive plot. This is where a movie like Civil War and even Batman v Superman, I am going to say it, Batman v Superman did a better job of team building than this movie did. And this movie has an established team, which is kind of disturbing that they couldn't, you know, it, I mean, if this had been four different movies, that kind of reach the same conclusion, a la like the Trocolor trilogy. Okay, I could see that. I mean, I, I would totally dig that, but it wasn't. It was one movie that tried to cram as so many different things into it that no one character got any sort of depth to them, and in the end, it just fell flat. So I haven't even gotten to my key gripe yet, but then again, my part two is going to be pretty much one long key gripe. So, um, but realistically my key gripe in this movie and this is something that i mean I, I just i still can't get over it because the first half of the movie i it was bothering me the entire time so the timeline they obviously you know in days of future past they reset the timeline so i get that we're not going to necessarily see the same events that happen in x-men and x-men 2 and all that that you know occurred before you know they reset the timeline with days of future past okay it's it's kind of a cop out but i'll i'll at least give them that. But there's a timeline that they didn't reset, and here it doesn't make any sense. X-Men First Class occurred in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. X-Men Days of Future Past took place in 1973 during the you know Paris Peace Accords. This movie takes place in 1983 during no significant event, just, just in 1983. That's 21 years. You would think in 21 years, people would age. Professor X didn't age. Havoc didn't age. Magneto didn't age. Moira didn't age. No one aged. And they don't even, like, address it. There's, like, no... It's it's almost just like they kind of gloss over. It's like, well, time does fly. But what really got me was when they introduced Havoc, they introduced him as Cyclops' brother. Okay? Cyclops in the movie is in high school. And, you know, there's an event that happens and sort of, like, you know, opens up Cyclops' character. And then Havoc, you know, comes home, takes him to Professor X's school. So now, you know, they, they do that. In 21 years, so if even if Havoc was a teenager in X-Men First Class, which, I mean, you could argue he was, but he was obviously still very young, but enough, enough to be considered an adult, even if 21 years had passed at this point, he would be almost 40, if not past 40, in this movie. Which means Scott, who is still in high school, would be like 17-ish, you know, 16, 17 in this movie. Which puts, at, you know, right there, like a 20 to 20-some year age difference between these two. And they they act as like, oh, they're just like, you know, close in age brothers. Not like two brothers who have absolutely no connection to each other. So the fact that they not only have botched the whole timeline of future events, but the fact that they botched the timeline of past events as well, it just, uh, it just, it goes to show how rough this movie is and, and just how thrown together it feels. And I know with each passing year, you know, we're getting further and further away from, you know, the original trilogy. So they're going to have to start doing stuff to, you know, kind of bridge that gap. But at the same time, it's, they're, 
it, it, it just the timeline is so broken now, and I I don't see how they can f- make it work in the future. Like if the next movie takes place in the '90s and everybody is still the same age, then it's I mean they're not even they don't even care at that point. It's more just this is an episode that happens with these characters. La 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 la. It's I mean there's there's no th- there's no continuity to it, and so. Whereas with something like the Marvel Universe and what they're trying to do with DC, they're at least like there's going to be some time continuity. Whereas here, there's none. They've completely botched it and it hurts. These are things that wouldn't bother me so much if the movie itself wasn't so, like, soulless. If there wasn't anything in there to latch onto. If this were a decent, like, fun movie, like, better than, you know, if, I mean, if it were at least on par with Future Past in terms of entertainment value, I'd be okay. I'd. I would it would still be my key gripe, but at least I'd be okay with it a little bit more because I could give it some leeway. But here it's just it it adds to the fact that they just did not seem to care. They just wanted to throw Apocalypse on there, put him out there as just a cheesy Power Rangers villain, and then you know when he's done, they move on. It's it's such a by the book story. It's there, there's no it it was just an all around disappointment which for an X-Men movie is disheartening because, I mean, you could say with the, you know, the comic book fatigue that there really is comic book fatigue now that we're starting. It's just like, oh, here's another one. I'm going to get another comic book movie. But at the same time, other movies are doing it well, like Civil War, like Guardians of the Galaxy. You can still do movies like this and make them fun and actually make decent movies without just, you know, like throwing throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks because spaghetti is really sticky. Have you ever tried that? It is so sticky. So I'm going to give this movie 5 out of 10. It had, you know, some, you know, good visuals, some good, you know, stuff in, you know, here and there, but overall it was a complete mess and a disappointment. So 5 out of 10 for X-Men Apocalypse. So check out my next video. It's going to have spoilers because I am not done ranting about this movie. So thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you again on Key Gripe.